Okay. Now imagine the <coughs> software development projects are generally when you work in the company, they are between hundred thousand dollar to maybe five million dollar projects. That's typically the range of the software development project. It could be less than hundred thousand as well. It could be fifty thousand, but it could go up to five million dollar projects. If, they, if you are building a big system with 50 people working on it, yeah, it could easily go up to five, 10 million. Now, imagine you are working in a company called JP Morgan, and you are working on the data warehousing projects, which are different than software development projects. Okay? Software is, you are building a software, going through agile process and whatnot, um, and you are still doing some SQL activity, not heavy. But when we are talking about dealing with the data, business intelligence, that is a one word if you might come across in the IT, BI projects or uh, data warehousing projects or machine learning projects or big data projects, those are terminologies, okay, that you might hear. But those are generally in the range of 20 million to 50 million to whatever, okay? So those are much bigger projects and it takes years, it, you can't develop them overnight because it collects the data from various different systems and then do, they do they have to build the processing on top of it. And then uh, they, they will have to analyze the data and uh, come up with, uh, do some prediction and so forth. So there are some modeling and a uh, lot of different things involved like a statistical models and all those things. Um, generally those projects are 20 million to $100 million not K, it's M, dollar projects. And there are a lot of things involved in the testing those things. Now, imagine if you don't know SQL and they put you on that project, are you gonna survive a day? Probably not. They will let you go on day one because it's all about data. You are talking, talking about data movement from one system to another, and then um, building out this type of uh, capabilities within the company. So here you need to get the mastery of the SQL. If you want to work on this type of projects, you have to know advanced level SQL and uh, so forth so that you can do the testing from your standpoint. Okay. So that's another beast out there, but it pays you good money as well because these are specialized skill sets in the data warehousing world. Again, large companies we are talking about and much bigger budget. So, but these are very common projects. Any company will have it. You can fit in as a QA and can survive with minimal SQL skills on this project. But here you have to pick up the fix with the SQL. Okay, so that, that's those are those skills. So regardless, if you acquire SQL skills, it's very, very, um, it's definitely gonna add value to your resume because people want to get some superman or superwoman and so forth. Who knows everything from there? All right, any question on this one? Do you guys understand the importance of the database or SQL side of things? Hopefully you, you will get it after once I go over certain things. So we will focus on this aspect here because we can't get you the complete in depth and advanced level knowledge here, but we'll get you some basic knowledge so that you understand what the database is. What are some basic SQL statements that you can write so that you can at least get moving in this direction? Okay. All right, if you never worked on database, that's just fine. But essentially, what it is, is we are talking about data uh, when we are talking about database. So, data is part of the database. So, you collect all the information in a some organized manner. Okay, that, that's all the database is, terminology about database is. It's an organized collection of data, okay? So when, when we say organized, can I find it easily? I mean, you can have a grocery list. If you don't put it as alphabetical order, it's gonna, you're gonna have a very tough time. If you don't organize by the aisles that you are going through, 
then you will have tough time. You might go to the last tile, come back to the first one. Again, how you organize it, that's very important. So the database is nothing but organized collection of data. Okay, so there is a way to organize it. Now, these are some of the old ways that we used to have database. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the yellow book. Yellow pages is still, I don't know, they still send us here to the business, but I, I think they don't, they stop sending to the home. But it's a thick book with the, all the addresses and uh, stuff, right? Where it's everything is organized uh, A to Z. So you can find the business or phone number very easily. Um, same thing, TV Guide. Have you guys seen TV Guide? Heard about it? If you are here in 90s, you used to get it almost every the weekly basis. What programs are on the TV, what time, and all those things. And we I used to get it because I'm here in 90s. So um, so those TV guides they are nothing but uh, on piece of paper, they are organizing the information. And you can call that a database as well. Okay. Now these are some of the modern ones, right? We all deal with airline reservation system, uh, you have BMV records, uh, and so forth. But again, if you are doing uh, like a papers in the filing cabinet or organizing on your computer, it is sort of database as well. Okay, you can call that as a data uh, database as well. Anything that's organized, that's all it matters. So what I'm trying to say is, it doesn't have to be in computer, essentially, necessarily. Anything on piece of paper, whatever you organize, uh, you can call that as a database, some type of database. All right, why do we need database? Again, we can't survive without database these days. We have to do some record keeping, uh, keep track of activities, sales records. Sky is the limit in the application. It's pretty much everywhere these days. Um, data and database, both. Okay, so what is the, what is needed in the IT world, right? What is uh, what is that we need to create this data databases, or how do we organize the data? So first of all, what you will need is uh, software, okay, which is called database management system software or DBMS. Okay, so you will have one software, and then you can start creating multiple databases on it, and uh, that, that's it. That's pretty much uh, it. But the software you can install typically on uh, one or more servers. Okay, so kind of like a computer, you can install the software and then uh, start building your applications on top of it. Kind of like Rflow. So Rflow has a backend database called Rflow database. That's where we are storing all the lender, dealer, and everything. And but it's running on a SQL server, one of the software. Okay, the so SQL server is the one that's we are using for our flow. And uh, you can create as many databases as you want, but you just need one software. You can have 500 databases on the software, build 500 different applications, and it will just work fine. Now, these are some of the popular uh, DBMS systems or software. Um, I'm pretty sure you, if you are, uh, working in a, any deal with any IT stuff in the past, Oracle, DB2, SQL Server, and Cybers. These are the most popular ones right now. Uh, these are commercially available software. Um, Microsoft Access is a more like a desktop, so you can install it on your computer and uh, start building out a data, small database. So up to million or five million records, you can use Access. But when we are talking about uh, Trillions of data or what a row records. You have to go with Oracle, IBM, a DB2, or SQL Server. That's much bigger database. Um, SQL Lite is a kind of like a mobile database. A any phone, they all have SQL Lite. Okay, so if you are storing something on the phone, most likely it is stored in the SQL Lite database on your phone. And there are some open source. Or free, kind of like a 
a free type of database where you don't pay any licensing fees. So these are freely available, MySQL, MSQL, and so forth. Now here, there are a bunch, uh, you have to pay the money, maybe $100,000 a year, companies pay to get these databases and build the application on top of it, okay? But these are, some versions are available in free as well. If you want to use it for personal purpose, yes, there are all, some of these uh, are available free. You don't pay money. But if you want to use a commercial purpose, like a build application and ex exposed to the world, you have to start paying money uh, for this one. But learning purpose, these are all available. You can download and install, and it will work fine. Okay, so when we talk about database, what is what is in the database, right? Or what what are the other things? So we know the software we will need. That's for sure. What are what other things? So when you talk about database, you will hear the terminology called tables. So tables are nothing but entities represented in the database. So now you guys will ask, what is entity, right? So entity is nothing but a piece of information that you are collecting and uh, organizing. So let me let me put it this way. So what information we are collecting in our R flow? You guys remember what what type of piece of information we are collecting? What is or storing in the R flow? What type of data entry we are doing? So you guys are creating lenders, right? Where does it go, lender? Um, so we have a piece of information called lender, right? All the entities that you saw in the design, those are uh, those are the entities we are talking about. So we have lender entity, user entity. It's the information about the user. Um, credit application. Then what we have, loser, lender, dealer. So these are some of the entities we are collecting in the database. Entities are nothing but it's a grouping of information that you are collecting. So lender might have lender is lender name, address, phone number, all those fields. User might have the same thing, email, all uh, credit app, dealer, same thing. Again, we are organizing the information in the entities when we talk about the um, tables. So this could become a table. So we could name a table called lender and all the associated fields, we will store it in the lender table. Same thing, user, credit application, dealer, that, that's all it is, okay? So this can become the tables in the database. Now you will hear the terminology called uh, record. Again, one lender record, one lender record that you are entering, it's a collection of related fields. So lender name, lender phone, email, for the specific JP Morgan that you are setting up in the system, that is called record, okay? So that's the one record. JP Morgan has a, its own record in the system. And fields, fields are nothing but individual piece of information that you are collecting for every entity. So lender name, that is one field, one piece of information. It's an individual piece of information. Then you could have 500 fields, who, who cares? Lender email, that is another field in the table, okay? Um, so tables, records, and fields, those are the common terminology that you will have. Now there is one more thing. Each field is assigned a data type. So think about uh, lender ID uh, that you are generating. It's, it is a number, right? So you don't want to put the text in there. So each field will have its own data type, whether it's going to be number, text, image, or whatever you are told. Okay. So just remember that for now, fields has a data type, and the type is nothing but what type of information you can store, whether it's a number, text, or email, uh, or anything else. So 
I think there is a better example here. So this is a data table. Generally, one table will look something like this. It's more like Excel, right? This is what uh, you have the columns and rows here. So every column is a field. Okay, this whole record, this one whole row makes a record. Obviously, this is a table, sample data table, right? Whatever the table name is. So these are individual fields. Now, if I assign, if I want to store only numbers in the zip code, I will assign a data type called number to this field when I set up in the database. Okay. So those are four pieces of things that you have to remember for table or database. Uh, Harshu, what is entity here? Is it the whole table is entity? Yeah, it's a logically it's called entity. The, the way you are organizing the information is called entity. But once you create in the database, it's called table. So law entity is a table, so kind of like a synonym of stuff. You can just take it that way. But in the modeling, we call, when we design it on piece of paper, we call entities. It could become a table in the database. Essentially, it is nothing but a grouping of all the information. That's all we are we are saying here. It's a more like a logical information. Okay. <laughs> um, I think we already talked about uh, record in rows, right? It, it's kind of like a collection of one or more field. That's that's a record in a single. Uh, it's a single structure of data item. Column we talked about individual piece of information, and it has some type of data type. These are just some of the common data types, but there can be other data types as well. Image number, text, binary, char, varchar, integer, double. Again, this varies depending on the naming. Varies depending on what. DBMS software you are using. So in the SQL server, you are calling a text as a char or a char. But in the Oracle, you might be calling as a text. Okay, same thing. So depending on the DBMS software, uh, you might be uh, having different naming convention for type data type, for the same type of data type. So this is kind of an example table definition here. So we are talking about students table. Um, here we have a field called student ID, last name and first name, three fields, three piece of information we are storing. Uh, field type, data type assigned to student ID is called number. So we cannot store any anything that's alphabetic. We can only store one, two, three, four, five, and uh, so forth. Last name, Field as a type called text, you can store both number as well as any alphabet over there. Okay. Uh, first name again, same thing. Now, as a QA, you're not going to design about or you're not going to worry about all these things. Okay. Somebody will design it for you. Uh, somebody will already kind of like a senior level developers or architects or somebody else will design the whole database, you are just interacting. But you still need to understand where the information is in the database and how you can query it, okay? From your perspective. Sometimes you need to understand what type of information we are storing. So imagine if the lender ID uh, is alphanumeric, you are expecting alphanumeric, but they built it as, a, as an integer or number. Then you can easily say, oh, this is supposed to be alphanumeric according to the rules. Why are we storing this information uh, as numbers? Because it doesn't allow alphabets in there. Those are some of the things you can, you can look out for that. But again, somebody else will design these things for you. You will just interact. But in order to write the queries, you need to know where information is. That's where these fields are coming uh, in the picture for you for this uh, database table. Okay. 
All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about uh, one more thing here before I come. I will come back to this one. Um, before we go, how do we go about designing the database, right? What is the process uh, for designing? Now, <clears throat> there are certain rules that the database the developers or architects, they apply on looking at the, uh, when they design the database, okay? Which those rules are called the normalization rules and the process is called data modeling process. Okay, so they go through, they look at the requirements, um, same requirement that you guys are looking at and they, they will pick up the credit application forms and they will dissect that form what are the different information, where that information needs to be stored. It's a whole process, okay? In the Columbus state, they have, on the design, uh, they have one class, which is over whole semester. It's a just for database design. Okay, so that's a, that's a complex process they go through. Um, but essentially, it's a first step in the database design. So, what it does is it creates a concept, starts with the creating the conceptual model, and then they will create the logical model. And from there, they will create the physical model. Okay, so logical model, and from there, they will create the physical data model. Now, physical data model is the one they will implement in the database. So that's what they will use to create the actual tables and schemas and uh, everything in the database. Now, what's the conceptual model looks like? If you look at the concept car, right? Concept car, any like a Tesla, whatever, they design on a piece of paper, sketch, it's just idea. That's what the conceptual model looks like. It's a concept car. But once they start figuring out the details about the car, they will refine the model and they will come up with the more detailed designs around it, which is called logical model. Okay, so that's what would, is, would be similar to the logical model. Now, once they start building the car, they will find some more issues, right? Or start before building, they come closer to the production, they will figure out other issues. So they will refine the car and finally they will have final model, which they can build. Uh, which is called physical data model in our case. In the real life, I mean, I don't know what they, what it is called in the manufacturing world, but that's the same process. There, it, there is no other process. It's the same process they follow here. Start with the conceptual model, come up with the logical model, and then what's the, once they actually implement in the database, that's called physical model. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the process. As I said, you guys don't worry about it. You don't need to know what, what is involved. Now, when you go for data, but it is important for you to understand once you, if you want to go to the advanced level, um, SQL and uh, those so forth, you need to understand how the physical data is, uh, is, um, is captured in the database. So then you can write the advanced level quest and so forth. Okay. So I'm not going to go into detail here. Uh, what's the process looks like and so forth. But that just remember normalization is a process where you can design the database. That's all. And when, when we say design, right? Organizing data in the database. That's all it matters. It's organized collection. How do we come up with that? Apply normalization rules and techniques. Now, one thing, when you apply the design principles, um, you will create a bunch of tables, right? As I said, a lender table, dealer table, all those things, you come up with that and establish the relationship between those tables. When we say establish relationships between those tables, so just, just get you the example. We have a dealer, right? Okay, and then user. Now, how do you know the user is associated with this dealer? We, we, there's a requirement, right? It says 
dealer has their own users. How do you establish that relationship in the database tables? Because dealer can be German, right? I have a record of German Toyota here. And user can be ABC, XYZ, whatever, first name, last name. But how do I associate these two records in two distinct tables? So there is a process in this process. Um, this process, normalization process, will allow us to ideally establish relationship between those tables. So there are rules that says if you want to associate user with the dealer, you, so there is a concept called, um, so you have that whatever the unique ID for the dealer is, you also associate that with the user. So shop ID, let's say shop ID here. This is a kind of like shop ID is unique, right? For the dealer. So you, you, are, you create one more column in the user table and associate that, populate the shop ID for that, okay? So that those are some of the techniques that you can use or the rules you can uh, leverage to come up with that. Okay. I'll come back to this topic a little bit now once we talk about the primary key and foreign key uh, so that it should make it uh, more clear for you guys. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> again, the design rules, uh, the other goals are eliminate the redundancy, inconsistency, dependencies, and all other things. But those are design rules. So this is one example of the logical model, what the logical model looks like uh, here. Now, if you guys looked at uh, logical model in our uh, requirements document, or maybe have you guys looked at it, this type of model? for the outflow. Let me, let me pull up afterwards. Let me explain what uh, the logical model is here. But logical model again is designed by um, <clears throat> the database uh, designers or architects and so forth. But what they will do is they will essentially analyze all piece of requirements, any information that needs to be stored in the database, and they will come up with a different uh, structure here. So what these are entities that needs to be stored in the database. For our case, it could be lender, dealer, user, and what else, whatever else we are stored. Okay. But here, what it says is, um, this is a classic example of the grocery uh, ordering type of thing or point of sale system uh, here. So you have a customer that places some type of order product and they buy some product, right? When you go to the grocery store, you will buy some product. The order uh, contains some type of order line and product is part of the order line. So if you look at your grocery store list, you have order number, you have each individual line item and uh, so forth uh, as part of that. And that's what this model represents, that process here. Again, this is the backend process. Um, and uh, so here, these lines are relationship showing the how the entities interact, basically here. So product is for order line and customer places one or many orders. So there are some notations and uh, so forth. So let me pull up here over, let me come back here. Let's talk about the outflow so that you understand a little bit more. Okay. So let me draw here the entity in the outflow. We have a dealer. We have a user. Credit app. And then we have a lender. I'm just going to go with four. So dealer, we have to do the similar logical model, right? For our purpose, I can, so these are the four pieces of information I need to collect as part of my application. So dealer, I'm showing the relationship between dealer and user, right? Same thing, lender and user, I can show relationship here. Then dealer and credit application, I can show relationship. And lender and credit application, I can show relationship, okay? Now, 
let's think, uh, imagine uh, you are a dealer, uh, a German Toyota, dealer is company. How many users I can have? You have multiple, right? So one dealer can have multiple records. So there are notations. This is how you can depict notation wise relationship. So you can have one or many user, or you can have this notation is zero or many user. And this one is for one. So one dealer can have many users in the system, in the Azure. Okay, this is what this notation tells us. Same thing, lender is a company, JP Morgan, and who is processing the loan, one lender can have at least one user to look at it and process the application, right? So one lender can have one or many users working on the credit application, uh, approval, rejection, all the workflow. Okay. So that's kind of like a way you can depict it. Now, dealer to credit application flow from here to here. Well, what do you guys think the relationship is? How many credit applications they can submit? More than one, right? So here, again, they could have zero because if they are brand new dealer, they may not have any application or more. Same thing, lender can approve or reject many credit applications, right? Again, this could become our logical model, okay? This is our logical data model that we can build in the Airflow and you use this to build in the Airflow data. Now, logical model is the one that you don't implement in the database, okay? You have to implement the physical model. So let me just show you quickly, how do we come from logical to physical, just as a high level process, okay? Now, <clears throat> Okay, so this one was our logical. This is what we have, similar to that for our flow. Okay, let me show you what the physical supposed to look like, and then I'll I'll we'll go back and revise it. So once you apply those all those design rules, what it says is, first of all, you have to identify the primary keys, foreign keys, uh, and so forth. And I'll talk about what those are for conceptually. Um, but primary key is essentially Every table has to have a primary key. First of all, you need one primary key for table. Okay. But what it is, it identifies the record uniquely in the table. So what is unique about lender table? How do we know the same lender record is not entered twice? Uh, so that's what the primary key identifies. Now, when you carry over and create the relationship with the second table, so you, let's say book and each chapter table, there are two tables here. So you carry, uh, so the book is a primary key here, but how do you know this chapter belongs to this book, right? So you carry, the, according to design rules, you carry book ID into the chapter table to basically relate those two tables. So this, this is common between those two tables. So let's say this one is one, and this one is one, two, three, four, five, Every one, two, three, four, five will have book ID, same book ID, which is one. Okay, so that's how you can relate it. Uh, so when you write the queries, you can join those tables and pull the information that you need. But when you carry this book uh, book ID into the other table, it is called the foreign key in the chapter table. So primary key, foreign key, same book ID. Book ID is called primary key here. But in this, this table, it is called foreign key, which points back to the book ID here. Okay. I know the con concept is a little bit confusing. Foreign key, primary key, right? Essentially, it's the same piece of information you carry to the different tables so that you can join, you can relate those tables. That's the concept of relational databases here. Okay, so let's come back here. This is our lender, so this is our logical. Now, what the rule says, you have to have a primary key for every table. So what I'm going to do is, I will have lender. So 
let's just come revise this guy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, let's say I'm assuming it's a shop ID or dealer ID, whatever we are giving, right? Every user has a user ID. Credit application is application ID, right? In our case, application or app ID, the lender has a lender ID. Okay. So these four tables has something unique assigned so that we can identify every record unique. Okay. This so app ID will never repeat in the database. When you say it's a primary key, it will never repeat. So it will be, it will start with one, two, three, whatever mechanism you have uh, for coming up with the app ID. Okay. Now dealer, remember what what another things a dealer has uniquely in the dealer table franchise number right so you have franchise number now i could have easily marked the franchise number as a unique as well but instead of that i chose to go with some sequential number okay but i could technically mark this one as a primary key as well okay franchise number because it is unique um, and so forth but here i'm not marking that i'm not using different field as a primary key. Now we said here, um, let's focus on these two tables. So dealer and user. Now, how do I know this user belongs to this dealer? So our rule says you carry the shop, whatever primary key is in the dealer table, and you put that in the user table. So I will have a shop ID as well. And there's a different notation dot dot dots uh, as well this one is a straight line for primary keys so this so i can carry the shop id to the user table in order to relate those two tables okay and the shop id becomes a foreign key this is a primary key right in this dealer table but it becomes a foreign key which points back to this primary key in the different table okay so in the user table it is called foreign key shop id but in the dealer table, it is a primary key because that's the main table with the shop ID generation happens. Okay. Now, again, design rules are complex, um, but you don't worry about it. But when, when it comes to the writing the queries, you need to understand how these tables are related. And you look at the common column names in those tables and then write your queries accordingly because you will be pulling the information from the multiple tables. And in this one query, you will be pulling the information for dealer, you will be pulling information for user, right app, lender. So you need to join uh, right in one query. How do you do that? You have to join all these tables. If you don't understand the relationship, you cannot write those complex queries. That's my whole point here. Okay. Any question on this one? Okay, so let's come back here. So again, primary key, foreign key, right? Those are some of the things that hopefully you understood the concept um, and so forth. A relationship, you probably would uh, deal with the logical models. You will be working with the physical model. But again, there are different types of relationship, like a one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many type of thing. But you wouldn't be uh, worried about that um, because it's mainly for the design items. Okay. So here, there's another example of the table here. So here I have department records table, right? And instructor records table. Now, how do I establish relationship between those two tables? So here, in this case, I'm carrying the department number to the instructor table. So that's how I know this instructor belongs to this department. Okay. Joining two tables on a common field. So department number and department number values are same here. So here, department A, right? So this could be department A. This could be department B. 
this could be department a it points back to here same value in those two tables see that's how we know this is software belongs to this department and when it comes to writing query i can join these two tables based on the common columns and write my query So let's uh, go over um, <clears throat> primary key, right? As, as, as I already mentioned, every table, you should have a primary key for every table, which is nothing but uh, it's a unique identifier for every record, okay? Must not have any duplicate rows. So it will not allow you to have duplicate rows. Now, there are couple of types of primary keys. Um, simple key is a single field. So I showed you the lender ID is a single field, right? We are marking it uh, as a primary key, but you can have combination of fields and mark it as a primary key in the database. I'll show you the definition, how we do that, so that you will understand uh, what it looks like in the actual database as well. But you can have combination of key fields uh, as a primary key as well. Okay. And how do we come up with the primary key? Normalization process, design process. Apply those rules and come up with that. And we talked about the foreign key as well uh, from that standpoint. Um, foreign key is uh, points to a different table. Uh, basically, which it, it points to another column in different table, which is also a primary key in the second table. So imagine you are starting, uh, when you apply these design rules, right? Um, you, you go through the design process, and let's say you have this spreadsheet type of uh, data that is business given to you. Once you organize this information, apply those all the normalization rules, primary key, foreign key, all different things, you could end up with this many tables, okay? Once you apply these rules on this uh, simple type of uh, spreadsheet looking uh, data, then you could end up with one, two, three, four, five tables, okay? Those are after applying the design rules. And then this is the one that gets implemented in the database, which tables gets created, and your application will start populating all the tables in the back end and uh, so forth. Okay. okay, any questions so far? What we talked about? All right. And I said, I'll get you the slides. Okay, don't worry about it. But this slide uh, will be revised a little bit after we put that. Um, so now let's talk about uh, once you come up with this thing, right? Implementing the database. Now, how do I deal with the data, right? Uh, how do I, how does the application populate the data, retrieves the information and so forth? So once you create this many tables, next part is the actual SQL to interact with the database. So you're gonna have empty cell, okay? If you come here, you define those structures, it's an empty cell, there is no data in there. Your application will need to populate the data and the application will use SQL to interact with the database. To interact, what I mean by that, right? Well, let, let me just uh, see here. Okay. So imagine this is our web page. Okay. And let's say this is now you guys know a little bit about database. So I'm going to tell you this is our Outflow database. Okay. Now application needs to interact from here to here. Now imagine what kind of activities we are doing here. 
what type of actions we are doing on the web page based on your what you have done so far. No, what type of information, uh, what type of interaction you are doing from web page to database? So you are creating a let's say dealer, right? What are the different things you can do on the dealer, dealer functionality? First of all, let's say something is empty, right? You have to create the brand new dealers, right? So when you create on the web page, when you click on save button, what it will do is, so this is brand new dealer, right? It will come and send all the information to the database in some type of SQL statement gets executed and the information is populated in the dealer table. Okay, at this point. So this is more of a create thing, create activity, right? Create new records, new info. Okay. So in the SQL world, there are certain SQL statements that goes along with the creating. One, the one is insert statement. So insert statement, that is what gets executed in the back end, and you have a brand new dealer record created at that point. The second part, let's say you, you um, after you create, let's say you want to find out the information. So you're gonna go to the search, type in the maybe Germain, and uh, that dealer information needs to pop up on the screen so that you can do whatever you want. So at that point, what is happening is you're firing a query with, you, with the Germain here on the page, and there's some query ex gets executed in the backend. And it will return you the information about German Toyota record, right? So all the statements that is getting executed uh, here is called select SQL statement. So select type of statements uh, in the SQL backend, okay, for reading information. Okay, so you are reading the information from the data. Now third type. Let's say this is exist. Let's say you pull up the German. Now you change the name. Again, you're going to click on save. The information again comes back to the database, updated information, changed, modified one, right? So there is a different type of SQL statement gets executed, which is called update. Okay. And finally, though in the Airflow, we don't have that functionality. What, what do we do? What do we don't have? The delete, right? You don't, you don't, you will never see the delete button anywhere. But if you had a delete button here, it needs to trigger something in the database. So that's called delete. If you want to remove the record, you have to execute delete SQL statement. The good thing, these are the only four things. Uh, remember the CRUD diagram, uh, CRUD terminology, C R U D create, read, update, delete. Those are the actions that's happening from the web page to the database, C-R-U-D. Um, good thing is those are the only four things you will potentially can do with the database data, okay? In the data in the database. There is nothing else. There is no other magical hidden thing. C-R-U-D, you know, there are statements, delete, insert, update, and select. Those four different types of statements um, that you can potentially execute and learn in order to work with the SQL. Okay. Okay. So I give you a little bit more um, on that, but uh, let's see, it's a set of command, right? So those six select statement, insert, update, and uh, delete, they are set of commands. You need to pick up the certain syntax. How do you write those statements when you are talking about learning SQL? Okay, that's all it is uh, with that. They are used for relational databases. Relational database, okay. Used for query and retrieval, right? As I said, I mean, you can use it for query and retrieval of the database, of the data. Uh, storing data, updates, and uh, Say uh, insert, those are the two commands. You can do that. Uh, 
uh, this one is not even relevant. So now as a QA, you mainly will be dealing with the select 80% of the time. Okay, when you are doing the QA work, 80% of the time, you will be dealing with uh, this type of statement, select statements. It's a simple statement, but it, it can get complex as you pull information from multiple tables. Okay, in the, in the select query. Now the simplest uh, select statement we can write is uh, select whatever piece of information you want to pull and from what table that you are pulling from. So in our example, let me come back here. So let's say we are dealing with the student table. So I can pull the two columns or two fields, select last name, first name from student. I can write as simple as that, and it will pull the information and show you on the page uh, from, from the absent form. Okay. Now, it has some structure to it. So let me come back here and uh, show you what it is. Um, so let's say we are pulling the information from D for DL. And dealer has a what if you look at the entities, right? So we have a shop ID, a name, maybe a, a, what is a phone. So it's a bunch of fields. Let's say we just want to pull three fields. So what I can do is I can write select command. There is a syntax to it, okay? Syntax meaning uh, you have to write it in certain way so that computer, the database can interpret it and send you the results back. So select is very important. That's a command, it starts with that. Select, then you specify what fields you want to pull. So here I can say shop ID, uh, name, separated by comma, four, okay? Now I have to specify which table in the database because this one doesn't tell you where, where those information is. So you have to specify in the query from, let's say our table name is dealer from dealer and that's it. If you pull that, it will give you something like this table format. It will give me three fields. One is a shop ID, name, phone, and the shop ID would be one, two, three. Name will be Jermaine, um, Tansky, Jermaine two, and their phone, 614, whatever it is, 740, in this format. So it will return me that information. Now it's up to you how you want to interpret it and what you want to do with the information. So in the application, you can actually show this information in the HTML format. That's what we are doing, right, on the dealer. If you go on the dealer search, you will see some type of table information, some similar to that. But ultimately, this type of query you need to execute in order to do that. Okay, so that's what the select basic select command here. As I said, there is a from that goes along with the select because it needs to know which table or table I need to pull the information from. It directs the query to use the whatever table name you specify. Okay. So this is kind of like a complete statement here. Select blah, blah, blah from uh, those tables. Now, let's say I want to pick a certain dealers. So let's come back here. Now I'm getting the three here, right? Three records. Let's assume I'm getting the three record in my query. Uh, <clears throat> But what if I want just a German record of the German? My query is returning three different records. If I want German, there is another class. I can specify where I can put some filtering on the on my query. So this is where you can apply the filtering mechanism. 
So where swap ID is equal one. So I can say something like this, and it will fill, give me only this first record where, where swap ID equals one. So that's how you can apply the filtering mechanism um, in your queries. So this is a kind of like a common syntax. So where clause will allow to use, uh, allow to limit our choice of records. That's the filtering mechanism. It, it has to be in a proper structure. So select whatever field, then from, and then where. So it's a syntax. That's a computer understand syntax only. If you make mistake, it will throw you an error and tell you what's wrong with your query. But here, this is kind of like a common syntax. Select whatever fields from table, where, whatever Boolean expression you have. So if I write this query here, what would I get from this table? Now star is here, right? Star meaning all the columns. That's all That's all it's saying. Instead of writing individual title, price, category, publisher, I can simply say star. So it will return all the columns from the table. So this is our query. So what it will return? What type of, what records it will return? So you need to look at the filtering, right? Category equals computers. So it will return Java. So this guy fits in where this is computer, this is computer. So these two records should come and return in my query. Okay, so that, that's how the selection would be uh, from there. Again, let's take a look at one more. Now you can apply, it's a Boolean expression, right? In the where clause. Here, we are looking for price less than one time. So title, price, publisher, from textbooks, price is less than 110. So it should come this one and this one, right? Those two records, it should return me in the query data. Okay. So, so far we are dealing with one table, right? This is a single table. We are pulling it and uh, picking out the information from there. Now, as I said, life can really get complex with you have 500 tables and you are pulling information from multiple tables. 500 tables is very common in the real life databases. Okay. 500 tables or 1000 tables information. I mean, uh, yeah, it's very common in the companies, what are mid size to small size, doesn't matter. If you want to pull information from multiple tables, you need to start using the joins. Okay. Remember the primary key, foreign key I talked about, the common columns. That's what you will uh, will utilize when we say joins. You must specify the on field which you are linking to the files using the on clause. I'll show you the syntax, what it looks like. Uh, but this is the example here. So here, what I'm doing is I'm picking out the title field from the textbooks table, textbooks dot title, price and required, okay, from textbook. So up to here is clear, right? I'm picking out three fields. Then this is the join syntax, inner join, course text. So I'm joining with a different table. On textbook dot title equals course text dot title. So imagine I have one table called textbook and second table called course text. Okay, I can write it. And textbooks, let's say title is here. Okay. Now there is a relationship here between these two tables. So this could be the primary key here. And the course text will have foreign key also called title. 
that same column will exist here. And they both have the same values, basically. So that I can join. When I say this equals this, this way it will compare these two values in these two columns. Anywhere it's matching, it will pull that up. Okay. And then it will apply the category equals computers. So there is additional filtering that's happening as well. I'll show you one example of join in the Athlon. So that you understand what we are, what I'm saying here as well. Um, okay, so we have an example here, right? So course text, textbooks. Now this is the same query. So how many records it will come? I I explained you guys a concept here, right? So it will join on this. First, textbook.title equals course text.title. So it will look into a Java intro, advanced C. It should come with a where category equals computers. So once it joins, so it, it will join, it will pull up these two records up to here. Then it will apply the filtering condition on top of it. The where category equals computers, which category. So only one should come up here because Java intro has category computers as well. Does it make sense? So title, right? First, look at the query up to here. Forget about the category. So if I do this up to here, so it will match the titles. Okay, so this one is match. This one is match. ADVC, this one is match. So it will match. Then it will apply the filtering on top of it. Okay. So within these two records, where is the uh, category computers? So both has it. So both will pull, should pop up, right? So both should come up in the records. But if one of them had a liberal art or something else, it will filter out in the filter condition. Yeah. Um, so let me show you in the actual database here, so which uh, makes a little bit more sense. Um, so our Artflow database is in the cloud, in the Microsoft Azure hosted on that. Um, and uh, there are certain tables, right? So hopefully you guys can see it here. So in the Azure, I'm connecting to the MySQL database in the Azure here in the cloud somewhere and then let me just pull up the dealer table so this is a dealer table hopefully you guys can see it is it visible from there okay dealer. okay so we are talking about the columns let me explain the columns here so here you see the shop id and it's marks as a pk primary key in this table okay other fields so this is the only primary key in this table. So primary key is a unique key. Then we have EFT account number, fax, phone number, all those things, bunch of fields, maybe like about 100 to 150 fields. Okay. Now let me show you the lenders table. So we have lenders table and you will see the lender ID, which is marked primary key here. And then here, um, nothing else. Okay. So that's the lender information like JP Morgan Chase or anything else. Okay. Let's go to the users. Okay. So first field is a user ID, which is marked as primary key. It's a unique number. Then you have username, password, all those things uh, that you are inputting on the screen. And let's see how do we tie the user with the lender. As I said, you can carry the shop ID, which was a primary key in the lender dealer table in here. And uh, as long as um, you associate, you can join basically on those two fields. Same thing with the lender ID. Lender ID and user table. So you are carrying the lender ID to mark the user as a lender's user, basically, at that point. So let me show you here. 
How do we write a query, right? Simple query. So I'm opening, uh, this tool is called uh, SQL Server Management Studio. I can install it and connect with any database that's out there in the cloud or on local machine or anywhere. Okay. Can you see the foreign key in the call? Uh, foreign key rules, right? So let me show you the foreign key. I don't think it's visible here. Let me just show you the, see if we have foreign key established here. This one, this command will show me the definition. So it's pulling, trying to pull the information here. So I'm looking at the definition of the users table. So there are no foreign key rules established, okay? But it is assumed, uh, so just like a primary key here, when you specify, you have to specify the foreign key rule constraint on the table set, okay? But they have, we have not specified the foreign, that's why you can't see that it points to other table, but logically they both are connected, okay? It's just the rule is not there. Okay, so let me just do select star from users. I was showing you basic command. So what it will do is, it will pull all the info, all the columns from the users table and show me all the records. So if I run this, so I have about 29 users in the system and you here the password is visible because we, it's a training database. So we don't have it encrypted, but again, you will see the training password for everybody, all the users and so forth set up. Now, as I said, the query can get complex or you can have complex filtering as well. Um, but what if I want to pick out uh, certain users only? So I can say where username like each person. So give me all the users whose username starts with H. That's what, that's what we have when I, when I say as I said, this query can get really complex and has some variations in there. So now it will give me HP. If I type in something like this percentage person and try to run it, it gives me a bunch of records matching with that. So what it is, it's, a, it's a more like a pattern matching. So you are trying to find H anywhere in the name in the user field. That's what I'm doing here. And it's returning me anywhere. It's a, a John J Smith has H in it. Yeah, so it's looking on this column and filtering it out. Okay. Um, let me go one more. Let me pick specific uh, columns here now. Username, uh, first name, last name from users. Now I'm working, trying to find out specific user. Okay. Let me come here, select star from dealers. Let's see if we can join and pick out a specific dealer. Okay, so I have Tansky Toyota, uh, German. So let's see if you wanna find out how many users we have for Tansky Toyota, how do I go about it? So that's where you need to start writing the joints, inner join dealers on dealers dot what is common between those two tables, which is a shop ID, because this exists in both tables. Is equal to users dot shop ID. Okay, if I do that, it will filter out, it will give me only dealer users from the users table. Okay. So these are all the users that belongs to the dealer, about 20 of those. Now, if I want only for Tansky Toyota, where so where shop ID. Um, dealers dot shop ID is equal one because this shop ID one is assigned to Tasty. Okay, so if I do that, it gives me there are six users belongs to Tasty Toyota or six employees they have set up in the system. Okay, so those are different ways um, you can write the queries and uh, work through it. As I said, 80% of the time you will be working through select statements and uh, we're working uh, only focusing on only that. Because you need to verify the data in the database. 
that's where you have to you start utilizing the select statements and uh, so forth uh, from that perspective. Okay. Um, I wasn't planning on giving you hands on, but if you guys want it, I may, may set up a separate time uh, on the during the weekdays or something to get you guys a little bit hands on on the outflow database. So at least you can run some basic uh, syntax and uh, so forth. But you're going to need some tools, which I can send you. So you can download it prior to that. And I can, we can go over that maybe uh, in an hour or hour and a half type of thing in one of the labs. Okay. Um, so at least you can get to get familiar with the select statement, okay? Because these are some interview questions as well for the select statement and uh, so forth. Um, now this thing comes with the practice, okay? It's, uh, you probably will not memorize, so definitely um work through that process and i think we have some of our camp videos as well which i can share, share with you if you just want to learn uh basically go a little bit deeper in the select uh, and other statements i'll send you a couple of camp videos that we conduct basically for the sql camp now you, that will help you i mean uh, uh, for that perspective okay and i'll get you access to this uh our flow on type of database where you can write the queries practices and so forth Okay, any question? Um, that's all I wanted to cover for this uh, select statements and up to here. Get you some basic fundamental uh, for database and so forth. And we'll work through in one of the labs. Okay. Any question online? I guess no question. Um, let's take a five minute break. And uh, what we'll do is uh, our next topic is uh, working through Jira. So we'll work through that process and uh, you guys will we actually do a lot of hands on on the Jira. Okay, that was our goal for today. Uh, by the way, I sent you guys an uh, invitation to Jira software. Did you guys uh, sign in or register? Make sure you go and uh, sign in. Okay, you should have received an email from me through Jira software or, or, or Altacian software. Okay. Yeah, make sure you log in right now and at least sign in. Set, set that up. Join the team or yeah, join the team. Yep, join the team because we have unlike uh, azure devops where everybody is working on silos here we have one project and i get give you guys access to that here we can do that should i create a password yeah you have to just set up a password uh, make sure you remember that because if you forget then i would be able to help you um so online folks uh, can you unmute your mic Uh, Dimpo, Orangi? Yeah. Yeah, so you guys received email from me, right? Uh, or Altacian software? Yes. Can you please check and go and create the account uh, and yeah. join the G for Jira? Mm -hmm. 